People are hostile. <laughs> and when you talk to people now, it almost seems like in an election year, they're flared up more about things. They love to talk about things and they got a tone. And some of it carries outside of just political views. And uh, if you turn on the news, that's enough to get your blood boiling, regardless of what you believe. And I just started to think about, as Christians, how important it is that we remember how, how important it is to God that we control our tongues. And so this is, this, this is due. This is due. I'm going to read a piece before we get started called uh, When Killing is Good. Today, I let them out without thinking. I was nervous afterwards, nervous about who they would meet, how they would be viewed by others, just basically if they would cause any trouble. I regret not being more careful with them in the past. Every time that I fail to pay attention to them, they cause trouble. When that happens, I get embarrassed. I understand it's never actually their fault. It's mine. After all, I know better. I know what they're capable of. The trouble they cause seems to keep going long after they've left. Other people just don't understand them like I do. Some people have told me that I need to nurture them more. Let them out and let them breathe so I will feel better. But I disagree. In fact, I've decided the best course of action is to suffocate them. For my own good, I need to kill them. It's hard to do that because I've grown to love them so much. But I simply must face facts. They have repeatedly shown me that all they do is hurt others. So no matter how attached I've grown to them or how much I love them, I will kill them today. And they will never leave this house again. More specifically, they will never leave my mouth again. They are harsh words. And I will teach my children to kill them too. Hmm. So today, as you see there, we read mostly from Proverbs on this topic about words. And to clarify, uh, I want to bring this up. The book of Proverbs is, is a book of wisdom, not a book of promises. And, and I bring that up because someone asked me a couple of weeks ago about a specific proverb. It was 22.6. It says, start your children off in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, this person that brought this up to me, the context was uh, a relative that had brought up to believe in Jesus and go to church. And then later they shifted away. And so when it was brought, the, the brought up to me, they said, you know, well, the Bible says this. Well, this is, this is advice. This is not a promise. This is the book of Proverbs. The entire book of Proverbs is godly advice for life. It's not promises. It's a good idea to do it. It helps you through life. So I've mentioned on occasion uh, and different messages about how in the past we're all either uh, a hero in someone else's life story or, or we're the villain and, and we're the villain in some other people's life story. It's just that's the way it is. And the quickest way to cultivate uh, a friendship or to destroy one or damage one is with our words. It's with our words. And this reality is not foreign to me either. I mean, it's, 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 it applies to everyone. There's people now that I know that thank me and they think yeah, I've, they've credited me for things in their life. One guy I talked to, he was on the brink of suicide with gun in hand. And there are others who say that I helped save their lives from alcoholism and just helping them get to Jesus. And I once picked up a man straight out of prison and he, he was a drug addict, and he had AIDS, and he was homeless, he didn't have anywhere to go. And I went and I picked him up, and I spent time with him to get, rid, to get right with the Lord and find a halfway house and get him started. And I baptized the guy who was on his deathbed. He wanted me involved because he remembered me from a long time ago. When he spent time talking to me outside of one of my band's shows, I stayed out back, apparently, I don't remember it, with him and talked to his friends for a long time. And he remembered that, and he wanted me at the end of his life to get involved in helping him get right with God. Now, okay, here's the thing. It wasn't just these actions that mattered. It was the words I spoke when I was with these people. To these people, I'm a hero. I'm a hero in their life. But before I go breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, there's other people where I used words as weapons. I said things I would regret. I'm not the hero, I'm the villain. One time I went to, to a meeting, was with uh, 
Grace's sister, their whole family was concert promoters and she orchestrated this meeting with a record guy who wanted to get my band a record deal and I didn't want to meet him and he walked in the office and he held his hand out and he said, hi Drew. And I said, I'm not shaking your hand, I don't like you. And I, I certainly don't respect you. So just tell me what you want and move on. And Grace's sister went, wow, Drew, really? And I said, he may have you fooled, but he don't have me fooled. That was an awful thing to say. I said that to somebody. What a jerk. I mean, that's a jerk thing to say. To him, I'm not a hero. To those other people, maybe. And once I got a letter from Anheuser-Busch telling me I could never, I'm no longer welcome to play at Budweiser sponsored events because of comments I made on stage. Mouth just shot off and gets away from me. Causes damage. People reach out and say, stay away from me. People say, I don't want anything to do with you because you're a jerk. Now, just, just to be clear, these type of rude interactions were not, were not the regular for me. But those are the ones people remember. Those are the ones people remember, the bad ones. When you, when you said they don't remember all the good stuff, they remember the bad stuff. I, in fact, I prided myself on being a nice guy. Um, but, I, but I never shied away from that stuff, and it was dumb. And many people do that. They, and, but some people, we've all heard people say this kind of stuff. They say, well, I speak my mind. I tell it like it is. <laughs> I just drop truth bombs. They say... The translation of that is I'm, I'm rude and arrogant and obnoxious and I have an excessively poor command of the king's English. That's what the translation is. When people say, I just tell it like it is, it's just an excuse to be rude. It's not telling it like it is. Because at the end of the day, that's what it all comes down to is words. Everything comes down to words and how we employ them. They're the most powerful weapon in human history that has put more people to death than anything is the tongue, the human tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And this is why you've heard me say on many times, I wonder if some of you can finish the sentence, the recipe for a blissful marriage is for when you're wrong, admit it, and when you're right, shut up, shut up. right. When you're wrong, admit it, when you're right, shut up. That's, that's if you want a good marriage, I promise you that'll work. You follow that advice. But have you ever noticed how contagious negativity is? People that use their tongue for constant negativity. Like if someone uses their words to bring a black cloud into the discussion. That affects your mood. It, I mean, and being around people like that's exhausting. That are constantly negative. Like, oh man, you're wearing me down. They brighten up a room every time they leave. And it's like, whew, man, I need something positive. They, that's... Uh, so this Bible verse, though, this, this Proverbs 18.21, it's not only talking about literal life and death, although it is talking about that. It's referring to any words that, that we use to either, you know, uplift or hurt. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We'll start with the anger, since that's the unpleasant part, right? Some of the common ways people weaponize their tongues. First is being critical. So when we criticize, we're choosing to focus on the shortcomings and flaws of others. I'm not talking about criticism that's helpful. I'm not, you know, we're just trying to help somebody through something. I'm talking about when we say things that we shouldn't say. Like, yeah, you know, that was a dumb idea. You know, can't you come up with something better? You're, all, you're always impulsive. You just go after the first thing. Is that, I mean, is that your best? Is that, that kind of criticism. That's unnecessary. And it's vicious. And I mean, sometimes we don't even criticize with, uh, with our words. It's with our body languages. You know, a sp and this comes to marriages too. What upsets a spouse more than anything is when your, your husband or wife is disappointed in you. And, and they, they do, sometimes they can, you, you might say something and they'll go, that hurts. That's a little thing. It hurts, but that's a criticism. I disapprove of what you said or what you did. And you, you, don't, you don't really rebuttal it, but you, you, you pack it in. That's being critical. There's positive ways to make the same points we need to make without putting an emphasis or a focus on a person's faults or, or you know, and resorting to insulting them. Like, you know, I mean, what do you think about trying it this way? Yeah, I think you can come up with a better way. You know, I've seen you deal with this stuff. You're good at this. I think, let's unpack it. Let's see if we can explore this a little bit. And think. I mean, you, take, you grab somebody by the hand and you lead them down a road instead of just putting them down. 
It's, it's not that hard. And I think most of us here know that. We know how to do that. And discouraging, this is the third one, discouraging people. That is a way to weaponize, to weaponize your tongue now. It's just what it sounds like. You know, removing their courage. Discourage to face the things that they're up against with confidence. That's stripping their courage away from them. That's what discourage mean. Because encourage means... It's the Greek word paraklesis. It means to come alongside someone. It, sounds, it means exactly what it sounds like it means. To come alongside someone. To, you know, you build them up. Let them know they're not alone. Express a belief in them. So to discourage is to strip that from someone. To use your tongue to discourage. It, to me, that's not only negative, it's cruel. I mean, I think it's cruel. It's not just bad to discourage someone. It's, it's downright mean. You know, I, I don't think you can do this. You haven't, you haven't demonstrated anything to me that convinces me you can overcome this. I think you should walk away and just kind of maybe call it a day. Just admit defeat in this case. <laughs> that's discouraging. I don't, I, don't, I don't, that's not a way to uplift someone you love. That's not godly. It's not godly to tell someone that. Proverbs 16, 24. There's a lot of them today. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health and to the body. Now, we're not talking about flattering words. We know the Bible says don't flatter people. You don't use your tongue to, to, to excessively dole out comments that aren't true, just to, to just some strategic way of getting something. And then we come to gossiping. Sharing information about another person that could be dangerous or hurtful. Creating drama by victimizing another person with your tongue. Revealing their personal information, right? In many cases, it's someone that you trusted. But if there's an interesting thing about this, these people that gossip and create drama. A friend of mine, um, a very good friend of mine, she's a psychologist. She spoke at an addiction thing. Uh, actually, some rally we did. And uh, Grace and I had dinner with her the night before, and we started talking about that. And drama, addiction to drama came up, and she, she said, that's a real thing. And we were like, what? What do you mean? And she explained it about the neurons in the brain. There's, there's some stimulation that occurs when there's drama being created, or there's drama. And, and there are people who do create drama that are addicted to drama, and it's a physiological reality. And she goes, here, let me give you an example. Uh, you're having some kind of cookout or friends and everybody's there. And this person maybe walks into the situation and is there for a little bit and says, there's no drama here. I'll fix that. And she goes, these are the type of people that say things to you. And I'm sure many of us have heard this. They say things like, listen, I just wanted you to know she said some bad things about you and I'm your friend. I care about you. I just think you deserve to know because I know you're a good person and it bothered me that somebody was talking bad about you and I just, I just don't think you deserve that. I, I, I care about you and I wanted to share that. <laughs> these, are, these are the kind of people that create drama and I'm thinking, I'd be a lot better off if you hadn't told me that. You know, have, have, I'm sure some of you have encountered people like this and it's upsetting. And if, it's, it's, and if you're one of those people, stop it. <laughs> but uh, there is an addiction to drama. A dishonest, this is Proverbs 16, 28. A dishonest man spreads strife and, and whisperer separates close friends. Proverbs eleven thirteen. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep confidence. Yeah, we're not talking about sharing information here. We're talking about... Gossiping. Sometimes you have to share information. You know, like if, uh, I don't know, maybe you're going to babysit a toddler who's got a, a mental disability and your friend tells you, well, listen, if you're going to babysit, you should know this about the child. That's not gossiping. That's sharing information because you're not, you're not being lascivious about rumors and, and untruths about someone, which leads us into the last one, and that's slander. That this picture, those bullets... I, any, any guy in here probably reacted the same way I did. That's not what a bullet looks like when it comes out of a gun. They haven't been discharged. They haven't been fired. That's kind of the point of the painting. Plus, if, if the shells weren't on him, it would look like he was puking acorns. So this makes more sense. The, the capability is there when they come out. 
to do to, 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 to harm or not to harm. So that's kind of the point of that picture. Just I know there's probably a couple. I know Mark Volman's probably like, that's not what a bullet looks like when it comes out. Right? You were the first one I thought of when I used that illustration. Right? Okay. <laughs> All right. He knows the caliber. All right. Slander, talking about others to make them appear in low character or to defame them. Now, this is from Leviticus. It says, what was that? <laughs> you have a horse ringtone? Sorry. Who? <laughs> 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 whose ringtone is lucky enough to have the horse? What's that? Who's, whose ringtone is that? Mine. Yeah. No, no, no. I know it's yours. Who's calling you? No, no, it's to remind me to test my sugar. Oh, use a horse. Oh, that makes total sense. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. You do you. All right. So this comes out of Leviticus. You should not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Ending with, I am the Lord. Doesn't that remind you of your parents? Because I said so. Yes. Now all the good stuff. The good stuff. It's common ways people use their tongue for good. Yes, yes, there's good fun stuff in here. Encouragement. Obviously, this is, this is one of the most single godly ways. The single most godly ways you can use your tongue to have a positive impact in someone's life. Because it makes it known that they're not alone. You know, paraclesis. Come alongside. And consequently, strengthens them. Iron, iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. That's simple. Sometimes we don't need to overthink this often. And pray, I know this is a, praying with someone matters. You can build strong relationship with people by, by praying with them. It's a spiritually intimate act. I mean, you share with someone, you go before God, you're praying. It's funny because you get people at church will share more with each other than they will with someone at the job. People that are close, a good church where you got close friends, you know, you, 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 people at work say, how you doing? You go, good. No, you're not. You're not good. There's all kinds of bad stuff going on. But, but with a, someone that you're in, in Christ's family with, you can find a place to pray and talk. Matthew 18, 20. That's, we know that's one of the, the most repeated verses in the Bible. Where two or more gather in my name, there I am with them also. And teaching. Teaching is positive. Passing along godly wisdom and life experience to prepare or assist someone else in their life journey. To help them with their life journey. This is why senior citizens are so, such a powerful resource in the world. And they should always be treated with the utmost value, respect, honor, and love. Because the wisdom they possess is a spiritual roadmap. It's a gift for the people who will accept it. Like it, it's, I always thought it was so foolish when you're a young person talking to an old person. Like, oh, they're just, they're just, they're, mm. you're missing out. I mean, we should all teach as often as we can, but we can't teach if we're not first willing to learn. You have to be willing to learn. In many cases, passing along knowledge without the company of wisdom is just a fruitless effort. It doesn't accomplish anything because knowledge is just information. That's all it is. Wisdom is knowing what to do with information. And it's usually gained through experiential learning. And who has more experience than the people who have been there and done that? The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. That's someone's, I don't need that, I got it, I got it, I'll be quiet, I got it. Oh, you're going to just talk about the weather all day. Yeah, okay. A tongue that passes along wisdom is blessed in the eyes of the Lord. We finish out the positive with the overall umbrella, and that's kindness. Because kindness, kindness is not just being nice to someone. It embodies all the elements of the ones I just mentioned. I mean, it, it, it brings them all together. Encouragement, intercessory prayer, and the sharing of wisdom. Because it shows the world it, what kind of person you are, what your heart's like towards your fellow man, and your desire for their well-being. This is all words. Words put everything on display more than the way you dress or the way you walk. It's the way you talk. Proverbs 31, 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. That's everything I just said in one sentence. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. 
Okay, so this is the last one. So listen, listen to me. <laughs> this isn't talk. We get to the last one that's addressed, and in most sermons, I hear, I hear other sermons on this, and the pastors talk about the bad stuff, like I did, the good stuff. Sometimes they put them in reverse about words, the use of words. And then they wind out uh, with a prayer, but something that's not addressed, I don't think enough, is, is what's left out too much, is the power of knowing when not to use words. Sometimes not using any words says a lot more. And I, listen, everything I've ever done has been revolved around me talking to people or being on stage or singing or stand-up con music. Now I work for God. That's what I did when I went to the Lord. I said, take my skill sets and let me serve you now. That's how I got this journey started years ago. So I know what it's like to mess up your words, go off the road and hit the berm and run into a tree. I do it all the time. People, because it's just the law of averages. You speak this much, you're going to make some mistakes. Do it at home, too. Hey, what do you mean by that? Why'd you say that? Sorry, a couple words get out. I let a couple I shouldn't, especially that one. I really regret that one. But um, it happens. So the power of being quiet is huge. That's what I opened today's message with. Harsh words. Words that need to be locked up. Sometimes they're not, they're, it's more important to be present than it is to be there talking. We don't always have to have something to say. So to end on a light note, to get close to the end on a night, light note, don't get excited. A few famous quotes about people who don't know how to shut up or don't know how to be quiet. When addressing what a fanatic is, you know, someone babbling and babbling and babbling about their own agenda, Winston Churchill said it is, quote, one who can't change his mind and refuses to change the subject. I think that's pretty accurate. Adrena Sawyer said this, some, misunderstood, some misunderstand silence as weakness when it's actually grace at work protecting what God is perfecting in private. I'm going to read that again. Listen very carefully. There's a lot being said here. Some misunderstand silence as weakness when it's actually grace at work protecting what God is perfecting in private. That's powerful. That's the person sitting there thinking, not saying anything, that God's working in them to let them observe and absorb so they can build a wise thing to say. And sometimes being quiet is what cultivates that. And now, my most favoritest part. Some quotes from the South that address people who babble on with nonsense. Number one, he shoots his mouth off so much he must eat bullets for breakfast. Number two, he blew into town on his own wind. Number three, her mouth runs like a boarding house toilet. <laughs> Number four, he's full of gas with nowhere to go. Number five, he got tongue enough for 10 rows of teeth. <laughs> Number six, he could talk the gate off its hinges. Number seven, he's a manure salesman with a mouthful of samples. <laughs> this is my favorite one. <laughs> I started laughing really hard when I was reading this morning. I can't do that when I get out there, but it, it, sometimes you think of someone very specific. She speaks 10 words a second with gusts of up to 50. <laughs> I, no, I'm, not, I'm not talking about my wife. <laughs> we know some people like that, but there, I'm not, no one here. Yeah, no one here. <laughs> Well, there was another quote that was attributed to Mark Twain or Murphy. No one can really decide who said it, but never argue with a fool because onlookers might not be able to tell the difference. These are all powerful about being quiet. So the power of words is just whether you use them to uplift, whether you use them to harm. It's also knowing when they're not necessary. Sometimes that's a problem I have. But the one I just, I just read you about that, you know, they don't know it's Mark Twain or Murphy, never argue with a fool because onlookers might not be able to tell the difference. That's in Proverbs. That's supported in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So the, 
The way you use your tongue and interact with your fellow man identifies the quality of your character immediately. Matthew 15, 11 said, It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, it's what comes out. People are like, oh, don't eat that. Don't, that's bad. That's against the religion. They said, don't eat shellfish. Jesus said, it's not what goes in that defiles you. It's what comes out that defiles you. It also shapes your character. It's like any biblical verse. Once you follow it, you get, you get used to it. You can feel God in you when you live this out. Proverbs 17, 27 said, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Now, using your tongue for good is, is power. With it, you can comfort, you can edify, you can uplift, you can encourage, you can be a peacemaker. One of the, the most rewarding jobs I ever had, I worked for this company. Uh, I was a technician, and it was an appliance company that was around since 1939 with a massive, massive customer base. And there were three owners, and one of them was very bad at over-promising and under-delivering. So he, he used to come to me, and um, we were in Columbus, but we, we sold stuff all over the state. People get mad. Something's late, or it gets damaged, or uh, it's it, they damage their house going in through a doorway, or something. And some some would go wrong, and he'd come to me and say, "Drew, make this go away." And I'm like, "What do you want me to do?" He goes, "Just go out and make it go away. Do whatever you have to do." This became a regular thing for me. So I would I, I would say, "Well, how are you going to pay me? Because I get paid on commission for my labor." And he'd say, I'll, I'll take care of you. And he did. He took care of me well. He gave me a whole day's pay. I could go out. It might be three hours, drive to Cincinnati, whatever. He, I would go out and show up somewhere where somebody was really, really mad. And as soon as they saw me, they're like, yeah, you, what are you guys a bunch of crooks? You know, you, what kind of outfit you run in here? They go on and go on and go on. I just let them wear themselves down. And I go, yep, yeah, you know what? I'm here to, I'm going to make this right. That's why I'm here. I understand. And there is no more powerful feeling then when I can encounter someone who's full of rage, and by the time I leave, they're happy. They're happy. And they were glad they met me. And they were glad I showed up. And I loved that job. I loved that doing that. I loved showing up when someone is on fire and rubbing their belly and putting them out. And they were happy and smiling and say, you're a good guy. That was, that was one of the most rewarding jobs I ever had next to this. Because this I'm doing for God. Not, not three guys that own a company. But I did love doing it. And, it, and, it, and I, it, you know, I remember when I did that job, the power, I mean the power, that's power. That is power. That's, and that's biblical advice. You use your words the right way. You can get, not only gain control of a situation, because we're not talking about taking control over a person. We're talking about making a person right and calm and happy and bringing them goodness. That's power. That's what God says is power, and that's what is power. You can control your tongue. Who are all the people you look up to in the world? They're people that have control of their tongue. They're people that can control themselves under pressure. They're people who are calm. That's because that's all of God. That's all, that's all biblical. All that advice is from God. Love diffusing people. So we'll end with this. Just a southern way to sum up the entire message of the sermon. Always keep your words sweet in case you have to eat them later. All right.